do another installment, um, learning how to pray, teach us to pray. And uh, this week, the topic is praying your hate. So hate is not something we usually talk about in church, at least not in any, not in an extended uh, format. But um, you'll see as we, as we get into the class uh, what we're talking about. Um, let me pray for us and then we'll jump in. Our Father in heaven, um, we recognize that we have all kinds of emotions, all kinds of responses to our experiences in this world, and we pray that you would give us instruction from your word today, that you would help uh, guide and shape our prayer life, especially when it comes to this issue of, of anger, hate, and so forth. Uh, Lord, give us instruction, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Looking around, I realize there's only a few people in here kind of in my age range, but uh, does anybody remember Mr. Rogers? Um, you know, I grew up watching Mr. Rogers, and I wish I would have paid a little more attention to um, the lessons that he taught uh, on his shows. Um, one time, a, a little boy asked him, I, it, he asks it in a childish way, but it's a pretty insightful question. Um, what do you do with the mad that you feel? So you have this little boy who's like, you know, I've got these feelings. I've got these, these emotions. I don't know what to do with them. What do you do with the mad that you feel? And so uh, Mr. Rogers wrote a song to answer the question. And he used the question as the title of the song, What Do You Do With the Mad That You Feel? I am not going to sing that song for you today. But I'll give you the first verse. You can, you can do a Google search and find it online. It's, it's pretty good. Um, but the first verse, what do you do with the mad that you feel when you feel so mad you could bite? When the whole world seems oh so wrong and nothing you do seems very right. So, and he goes on in the song to talk about uh, what to do. But, uh, you know, Mr. Rogers in that song and all throughout the, the program, he discouraged kids from ignoring or dismissing uh, their emotions, especially emotions like anger. Um, and he, he had this saying, if you remember um, the series, he had this saying, feelings are mentionable and manageable. And then he would, he would also say at times, what's not mentionable is not manageable. In other words, if you don't uh, somehow recognize and acknowledge the emotion, you're never going to be able to do anything about it, um, respond appropriately. And so he encouraged kids, you know, acknowledge the emotions, talk about the emotions in, in that song. He encouraged kids to kind of channel their, their pent-up anger into fi uh, physical activity, so uh, pounding clay, running fast, that kind of thing. Um, you know, Mr. Rogers was trying to prepare us for adulthood, but, but many of us kind of didn't really uh, learn the lessons. You know, even as adults, uh, we're probably wondering at times, what do I do with the mad that I feel? And as we're talking, uh, you know, I'm talking about being mad, angry, so forth, <clears throat> so forth today. I'm not talking about just being annoyed with somebody. You know, somebody cuts you off on the freeway and you're, like, and you're annoyed. That, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, you know, little petty grievances. I'm talking about um, times when you should be mad. You know, you or somebody you love are the victim of wickedness and evil and injustice. You know, sometimes... I think we, we are not mad or not mad enough about the things we should be mad about and, and maybe too mad <laughs> about things that maybe we shouldn't be. You know, we, we often aren't angry about the things that God gets angry about, the, the way his image bearers are harmed by people who do bad things. And so when we're talking about praying your hate, I'm not talking about the neighbor who plays their music too loud on the weekends, okay? Um, that, that, how do you deal with that? That's a different class. But what do you do with these, these responses to the, the evil that you experience or that people you know experience? Um, let me talk about two dead ends, uh, two ways we tend to go. Uh, the first one would be acting on those feelings of anger, hate, and revenge. So 
taking upon ourselves the, the personal responsibility to do something about it. Uh, revenge, seeking retribution on the wrongdoer. Um, you know, this in, in our society, um, it's seen basically as, a, as morally permissible, at least in certain uh, circumstances. I mean, you just think of um, the, some of the popular films, one of the most uh, popular film franchises over the last decade, The Avengers. I love those movies, but, but the idea is, you know, revenge against the wrongdoers. Or uh, John Wick, you know, um, he's an ex-hitman who, um, you know, the people that he used to work for kill his dog and steal his car, and so the, he's going to seek revenge. There's more to it than that. The dog was a gift from his wife right before she died so that he wouldn't be lonely, you know. Okay. Um, but there's other movies. I have a whole list here. Who remembers First Blood? Rambo. It's all about revenge. Uh, Death Wish with Charles Bronson in the 70s. Uh, Gladiator, former Roman general, seeks vengeance against the corrupt emperor who uh, murdered his family and enslaved him. Uh, the Punisher, undercover FBI agent who turns into a vigilante to avenge the murder of his family. So forth. We love these movies. <laughs> What's impressive? Uh, I went on IMDb and looked for top revenge movies. <laughs> um, there was a whole list. Um, you know, revenge, uh, while it might seem like a, a good option, might seem like it would bring about some kind of resolution, um, it really ends up entangling the victim in the same kind of behavior um, as the perpetrator. So the person who, who engages in revenge ends up doing the same kinds of things that were done to them or to those, uh, to people they love. And, you know, revenge without God in the picture is just, it enslaves. I mean, you think of, it, it really just creates a, a vicious circle, you know, revenge and counter revenge, and, and it just continues on and on. Um, Hannah Arendt, who was a 20th century uh, political philosopher, talked about the, the predicament of irreversibility. There's these situations, these evils that happen, and they can't be undone. And revenge is not going to change that. It, the, the person who engages in revenge might think that it will, but it actually doesn't change what happened. And so... Uh, it, you know, revenge is really a fruitless way of dealing with the, these things, these, the predicament of irreversibility. So that's one option is, is to engage, act on your anger, act on your hate. Uh, another option, which is maybe the option we, we go for as Christians more often, is suppressing, dismissing, or ignoring uh, your outrage. So... Um, you know, and, and when we do that, if we just try to say, no, you know, I'm not supposed to be simply angry, and so I'm just going to kind of just try to shove these things down. Uh, what ends up happening, number one, uh, we can tend to minimize the evil that was done. So um, some things that people do uh, require a response of outrage, uh, appropriate outrage. So we might end up dismissing or minimizing the evil that was done, or we might discount the hurt that was experienced. Um, and, and suppressing doesn't actually work. You've probably learned this in your own experience. Um, you know, trying to express or uh, suppress um, outrage or anger at, at evil and injustice, it's kind of like, you know, you take a big beach ball and try to hold it, uh, you know, in a pool, try to hold, or in the ocean, try to hold it under the water, you know, it, it gets unruly, and eventually it's going to pop back up to the surface. And the same happens with, with those feelings, the mad that you feel. You try to suppress it, it's going to show up some way. Um, it might show up as um, elevated blood pressure, or GI problems, or... Um, you know, migraine headaches, or um, if the emotions aren't really acknowledged and dealt with, uh, it, it might make the person more likely to act on those 
those feelings. So uh, if the emotions, if anger, rage, outrage aren't acknowledged, um, they can't be put to good use. They can't be channeled properly. Uh, John Swinton, who's written on this, he says, uh, vengeance is God's. So he has a book on the problem of evil, and he talks about, you know, vengeance is God's prerogative. It's God's responsibility. But, he says, anger belongs to the victim. And he, he's talking about righteous anger here. Anger belongs to the victim. And he says the question is, how can the victim express righteous anger in a way that will not trap them in a vicious spiral of bitterness and hatred? And, and so that's what we're getting at today. What do you do with the mad that you feel? Um, there's an alternative, you know, those two ways, either acting on the, the anger or suppressing the anger. There's an alternative. Christianity holds out a, a different way to, to respond, and that is praying your hate. And this is what the Psalms teach us to do. They provide us with a practice for engaging faithfully with uh, the, the very real emotion of, of anger um, at evil and injustice. Um, you know, the beautiful thing about the Psalms, most of Scripture speaks to us. You know, it, it's, it's, it comes in the form of instruction directed at us. Um, the Psalms, and Athanasius uh, said this in the 3rd, 4th century, the Psalms speak for us. I mean, they also speak to us. But the Psalms, uh, every, they express the full range of human emotions. From just overwhelming joy in God's presence to, um, you know, the, the blackest despair. And those emotions include um, anger. And so... Uh, Eugene Peterson, who's written a lot on the Psalms and prayer, he says, uh, our hate needs to be prayed, not suppressed. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today, is how do we pray our hate? And, and the way we're going to do that, we're going to look at what um, I'm calling the hate Psalms. Uh, they're, they're also some, you may have heard them called the imprecatory Psalms or the vengeance Psalms or, um, you know, other, tit other titles uh, this is, you know, Psalms like Psalm 7, uh, Psalm 69, Psalm 109, 137, 139, and, and others. Um, it, it's, you know, you have different genres of Psalms. There are Psalms of thanksgiving, Psalms of praise, Psalms of lament. The, the imprecatory Psalms or hate Psalms aren't so much a, a genre as they are parts of Psalms. So, you might have like one of your favorite psalms with just like your, your most beloved verses. For example, uh, Psalm 139. You guys know Psalm 139, right? Um, let me just turn there for a moment, read a portion of it to you. Uh, just seems like such an uplifting psalm. You know, you know the beginning, O oh Lord, you've searched me, known me, you know when I sit down, when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar, you, you know, you formed me in my mother's womb. You, you guys know this psalm, and um, towards the end, how precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God, how vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I'm still with you. And we're like, yes, this is awesome. God knows me, God cares about me, God's with me. And then all of a sudden, oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. O oh, men of blood, depart from me. Do I not? And then he says later, do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? I hate them with perfect hatred. You're like, where did that come from? <laughs> That's so when we're talking about imprecatory psalms, hate psalms, sometimes it's a whole psalm, sometimes it's parts of psalms, but it's these psalms where um, they contain prayers and wishes for justice to be done to one's enemies. So you find a lot of enemy talk in, in the psalms. Uh, Eugene Peterson again said that uh, those who pray have a lot of enemies, and they spend a lot of time praying about their enemies. And um, these psalms, they express rage. We'll look at some as we go on. They express anger. They express even a desire for 
vengeance, you could say. And um, some Christians are uncomfortable with these psalms. You know, in, in certain uh, lectionaries where they, they prescribe readings for the church to use throughout the year, they'll, they'll include the part of the, they'll remove the imprecatory part of the psalm. So there may be a reading of Psalm 139, those final verses about asking the Lord to slay the wicked, they don't include that. <laughs> They're like, okay, we should not be talking like that in our, in our Sunday worship. Um, you know, there's some legitimate concerns here that these psalms seem to express ideas and attitudes that are contrary to Jesus' teaching. I mean, how did Jesus, what did Jesus tell us about how to treat enemies? Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And then here in the Psalms, you've got, for example, Psalm 137, um, talking about the exile in Babylon. It begins as kind of a, a lament and then a, also a psalm of trust. We're going to keep trusting the Lord even here in this foreign land. But then verses 8 and 9, uh, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. What? <laughs> um, so it seems like this runs contrary to what Jesus told us. Psalm 10, verse 15, break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. Uh, Psalm 58, verses 6 and 8. Oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. And he's, t he's talking about people. Um, let them vanish like water that runs away. When he aims his arrows, let them be blunted. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime, like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. And we think, we're Christian people. We're not supposed to pray like that. Um, so some Christians are uncomfortable with these. It, the, these psalms seem to give a license for violence. And if not outright violence, at least for Verbal violence, uh, verbal, you know, labeling anyone we dislike as an enemy. You know, again, the, the person who cuts you off on the freeway. And it's like, you know, may the Lord break your teeth and, and break your arm and hit you over the head with it and whatever. Um, and, and that is a real danger that we just think we, you know, this is a license to vent and we're going to see it's not. But if we take the Psalms as a guide to life, which the church always has, um, David Taylor says, if, if we do that, if we take the Psalms as a guide to life, um, we see that enemy talk does have a place in the life of faith. He says, faith happens in a hostile world. Faith works itself out in the middle of enemies, not the silent chambers of the soul or only in the company of folks who were poorly intended. In other words, you know, we relabel evil as, well, that person, they just, you know, they didn't mean to do it or whatever. David Taylor is saying, no, I mean, we live in a world where bad things happen. We live in a world where people do evil things, and God invites our honest prayers about these things. He, in, he invites our honest prayers about the evil we experience, the suffering we experience, or that our friends and family, brothers and sisters in Christ experience. So, um, we're going to look at a few aspects of these psalms in a moment, but let me say this. The hate psalms don't condone violence. They don't encourage nursing bitterness and hatred. Uh, they show us what to do with those intense, visceral responses to the, the bad things that happen to us or in this world. So a few aspects of, of these psalms. So... Um, I have these listed there in your handout. Um, a few aspects of these psalms. One, they name our enemies. The, the psalms, these psalms encourage us to name our enemies. Um, you know, these imprecatory psalms identify certain people as enemies. Certain people as evildoers, wicked, um, oppressors. And, you know, you think, well, didn't Jesus tell us to love our enemies? Yes, he did. But that assumes that we've identified certain people as enemies. Um, for example, Psalm 109, 
which if you wanted like the, a good example of an imprecatory psalm, Psalm 109. And uh, I'll read from it a bit, but the, the opening verses. Uh, Be not silent, O God of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer, so they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. So probably a courtroom scene where somebody's being falsely accused, and the psalmist says, you know, there's these people, they're, they're liars. They're full of hate. Um, they, they encircle me with words of hate. They're, they're attacking me without cause. Um, Psalm 59, 1 and 2. Deliver me from my enemies, O, o my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil and save me from bloodthirsty men. And, and you know, there's, there's many other psalms you could look at that, that talk like this, this enemy talk. Is it okay for us as Christians to pray like this? To, to, call, to in our prayers to God, say, well, there's these people in my life that are doing really awful things. They're enemies. I mean, shouldn't we believe the best about people? That's usually the counsel we give to each other, right? Well, you should believe the best about the other person. Now, that is wise advice in normal relationships, not to assume motives. You know, there's often misunderstandings. That's usually kind of at the root of conflict. Um, but uh, the Psalms speak honestly about our world. So this enemy talk isn't just, you know, some crotchety old man who's just like hates everybody and labels everybody as a, as a bad person. These Psalms are, are recognizing that this world is full of people who do bad things. That uh, innocent people get hurt. Women get raped. Elderly people get deceived by scams. Uh, real awful things happen. The world's full of broken people. It's full of victimizers and victims. It's full of oppressors and the oppressed. And sometimes the victims become the victimizers. It, it's really a... It's nasty, this world that we live in. It's ugly. Um, enemy's speech in the Psalms is honest about this world. It's honest about our capacity as human beings to, to harm others. Um, so th this enemy's speech, again, is not just the ranting and ravings of a, of a crotchety old person, crotchety young person. Um, it's about reality. And so the, the imprecatory psalms name the enemies. The imprecatory psalms also name our experience of enemies. Um, again, uh, David Taylor, he says that the harm that some experience demands language that fits. Um, you know, naming the experience, one's experience, giving it, you know, concrete terms, um, naming the experience of evil and suffering and the sins that have been committed against you or committed against others, um, it gives what happened weight. It, it, it gives it significance. It also gives concreteness and clarity. It says something happened and it was bad. It was wrong. And here's what it was. Here's the, the way it was wrong. Um, these psalms give a, a language and a vocabulary to us for the, the hurt caused by enemies. Uh, let me just give you some examples, um, just the, the vivid language the psalms use for this. It's like being hunted by a lion and torn to pieces, Psalm 108, or Psalm 10, sorry, 8 and 9. Speaking of the enemy, he sits in ambush in the villages, in hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The psalmist is saying, there's evil people after me, after the, in that context, the poor and the needy. And they're like vicious lions hunting their prey. And when they get their prey, they, they tear it to pieces. It's like being trampled to death. 
Psalm 56, 1 and 2. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. You know, this is the voice of someone who's suffered injustice, saying it's like people are just walking all over me. Their, their heel is on my neck. They're, they're, it's like a pack of wild animals that's trampled me. Um, uh, another one, it's like drowning or, or being swallowed alive by a terrible monster. Psalm 69, uh, verses 14 and 15. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. Uh, the, that's language the Psalms use a lot. The the waters, the ocean, it's deep, it's, deep, it's dark, it's mysterious, it's, it's chaotic. And the psalmist is saying, you know, these enemies are after me and they're like these deep, dark waters. Don't let them swallow me up. Don't let the, the pit, Sheol, close its mouth over me. You know, just picture some awful monster um, swallowing, swallowing you alive. Um, the, these psalms, they... they Give us language to talk about the, the bad things that go on in this world. Uh, it gives a voice to the, the suffering and the oppressed and the marginalized. Um, J. Clinton McCann, who's written on, on the Psalms, he says, In the face of monstrous evil, the worst possible response is to feel nothing. So that's kind of the, the suppress the, the feelings, you know. Um, the worst possible response is to feel nothing. What must be felt is grief, rage, and outrage. In their absence, evil becomes an acceptable commonplace. So the Psalms help us, these Psalms um, help us give voice to appropriate rage at evil, injustice, sin, wickedness. Um, so they name our enemies, they name our experience of enemies. These Psalms this is important to recognize. They are words, not actions. So the, this is something a, uh, the psalmist is praying. Um, and, and the prayers are shocking at times. I'm going to read an extended section from uh, Psalm 109 in a moment. Uh, they're shocking at times. There, there's anger that we assume should not happen in the life of faith or in the context of the worshiping community. There's, there's venom. There's even, you could say, hate. Uh, they contain petitions and wishes against enemies, but they're words, not actions. So let me give you an example. Psalm 109, uh, verse 6, and then I'll, I'll read through verse 15. It, it goes on longer, but um, just listen to what the psalmist says. Appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few. May another take his office. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children wander about and beg, seeking food far from the ruins they inhabit. May the creditor seize all that he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his toil. Let there be none to extend kindnesses to him, or kindness to him, nor any to uh, pity his fatherless children. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. And it goes on. And you think, uh, I, I like um, what uh, Walter Brueggemann says. He says, the words pile up like our nuclear stockpiles without recognizing that nobody needs to be or could possibly be violated in that many ways. But this is not action, it's words. And the Psalms, it, we have to recognize the, about these imprecatory Psalms, is the psalmist is not saying, I'm going to do these things. He's praying, and we'll, the next point is about he's speaking to God. He's, he's praying things. The psalms, these imprecatory psalms don't encourage us to engage in violent acts, but they do give us space to express outrage. 
And again, not because somebody cuts you off on the freeway, okay? Um, that, that's an example, you know, somebody cuts you off on the freeway, we need to learn patience, long-suffering, self-control, that kind of thing. Um, somebody murders your family, that's, there's outrage, it should be there. Um, so these, these imprecatory psalms are words, not actions, and, and next, they're spoken to God, not to the enemies. And, and this is important. The psalmist who utters these words is not standing face to face with his enemy, uh, giving a, a verbal beat down. The psalmist is wrestling with God in prayer. The psalmist is pouring out his heart to the Lord. So the imprecatory psalms aren't a license to verbally um, assault an enemy. The psalmist brings his hate and his anger and his outrage before God. And there's a sense in which that, that act of pouring out that torrent of rage before God is an act of handing it over to God. And we'll talk about this more in the, the next point. Entrusting it to him because we can't be entrusted to hold on to that for too long. We easily veer toward unrighteous anger, sinful anger. Um, we can't be entrusted to hold on to it. The psalmist leaves his enemies in God's hands. He, he's, these are prayers that God would do something about the evil that has been committed. The psalmist is in no, doesn't pray for the strength to do those things. He says, God, here's this evil person. Take care of it. Um, you know, for example, the, towards the end of Psalm 109, 109 verse 21, after that, you know, that just that litany of may all these things happen. But you, O oh my God, uh, but you, O oh God, my Lord, deal on my behalf for your name's sake, because your steadfast love is good, deliver me. So the psalmist is saying, ultimately, Lord, I'm, I'm bringing the enemy before you and asking you to to work out justice. Um, the psalmist even places himself before God. So again, we easily veer off into unrighteous anger. Uh, Psalm 139, uh, we read from it a little earlier. Um, right after the statements about, oh, that you would slay the wicked, um, and I hate uh, those who hate you, I count them my enemies. Then the psalmist says, verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So when we pray like this, we're recognizing that maybe a real injustice has been done and we feel something of appropriate outrage and anger, but then our emotions are always mixed, right? And there, there might be some unrighteous anger in there and, and maybe... We're nursing some bitterness, and we're saying, Lord, uh, yeah, I need you to act, but I also need you to, to show me what's in my heart and purify whatever's wrong with the way I'm thinking about this. And so all this rage takes place within the context of a conversation with God. This is not somebody on Twitter just, you know, going on a, a rampage against everyone they dislike. Uh, this is not, you know, just somebody on TV, just, you know, those people and blah, 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 blah. You know, maybe if we spent more time bringing our rage to God, we'd spend less time, you know, blowing up in rage on social media or in personal uh, conversation with people. So... Uh, it's important to understand there that the, the psalmist uttering these, these pleas for justice is speaking to God, not to the enemies. So how do you pray your hate? That's, you know, we scratched the surface on the, on the imprecatory psalms, the hate psalms. I just want to spend a few moments talking about, well, what do we do with those? Um, you know, some Christians would say, some Christians do say, that we shouldn't do anything with these psalms. I, I was looking at a commentary from a, um, a guy who's written on the psalms that I, I use his commentaries all the time on the psalms. They're, they're wonderful. Old Testament scholar, evangelical guy, 
Um, and he's got this uh, whole section in the intro about how to understand the imprecatory psalms. He makes some really excellent points. And then his last sec- the last section is, you know, what use do they have in the Christian church? And he says, they have no use. We should not use them. They're, they're, they're just like out of bounds for us. And, and I think that um, I'm not going to go into a whole apologetic for why I think that's wrong, but I think that's wrong. I, 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 they're here for our instruction. They're here for our use. Uh, psalm 69, which is a, an imprecatory psalm, is used, quoted numerous times in the New Testament about um, Jesus. And uh, I think they are for our use uh, when we use them appropriately. So um, let me, let's talk about how to pray your hate. Um, I'm just going to bring out three steps. Uh, not as if this is the only thing you can do. But uh, number one, bring your outrage to God. Bring your outrage to God. Um, every aspect of our lives should be brought before God. Every, everything that we are should be lived out in the presence of God. And even our anger and rage uh, Miroslav Volf, who's written about this stuff, says our, our rage belongs before God. That, that's the appropriate place for our rage. Um, outside of, of that, it, it can get dicey. The psalmist refuse to keep those emotions just within. They refuse to suppress emotions. I think that's why we're often very uncomfortable with the psalms, because... They, they, the psalmists say things that were like, no, good, good Christian people shouldn't be talking like that. Um, they're much more comfortable with a, a vibrant, robust, emotional life, especially before God, than we are. Our, our Christianity, North American Christianity, has been too shaped by kind of uptight Victorian sensibilities. And the psalmists don't share those, those scruples. Um, the psalmists pour out their rage to God. Um, they felt free to give full expression um, of it before God. Um, you know, the only kinds of prayers that are worth praying are honest prayers. I mean, why try to hide, whether it's, it's righteous anger or unrighteous anger, why try to hide that from God? He, do we actually hide that from God? We might think we are, but he knows it's there. Why not just talk to him about it? Um, Eugene Peterson, l- let me read an extended quote about bringing our outrage to God. He says, it's easy to be honest before God with our hallelujahs, you know, our, our praises. Uh, it's somewhat more difficult to be honest in our hurts. It's nearly impossible to be honest before God in the dark emotions of our hate. So we commonly suppress our negative emotions, or when we do express them, we do it far from the presence, or what we think is the presence of God, ashamed or embarrassed to be seen in these cursed, curse-stained bib overalls. We must pray who we actually are, not who we think we should be. In prayer, all is not sweetness and light. The way of prayer is not to cover our unlovely emotions so that they will appear respectable, but to expose them so that they can be enlisted in the work of the kingdom. Um, So again, Peterson's saying, look, be honest. Bring your outrage to God. Um, Talk with him about it. Here's something maybe we need to recognize. God can handle our raw emotions. And the Psalms show us that over and over again. Um, God knows, as I've said, what's inside of us. And um, if, you know, we talked at the beginning different ways of dealing with anger, you know, the act on it or suppress it. If, if we don't become more comfortable and skilled with bringing our outrage to God, that outrage is going to show up in sinful ways in our lives one way or the other. We're going to act on it somehow, or it's just going to become destructive to us uh, spiritually, physically, like I mentioned earlier. So bring your outrage to God. Um, I gave you a list of some psalms earlier. You can start 
I would encourage you to look at those psalms and see how they, the psalmist talked to God about the people who are doing bad things to them. And um, start to let that uh, shape your own prayers. Now, we need to recognize this isn't just about venting. And maybe that's what all this sounds like to you. You know, talk about bringing your outrage to God. It, maybe it just sounds like the equivalent of like, you know, um, shouting at a wall or something like that or, or punching a punching bag, which might not be a problem, actually. It might be good. Um, but we need to not only bring our outrage to God, uh, we need to entru entrust God with the outcome. And so remember, when I talked about these are words, not actions, and the psalmist is speaking to God, not the enemies, he's entrusting the outcome to God. So we bring our rage before God, not, not simply to vent, but so we can hand it over to God. So we can, it's an act of faith to bring your hate to God. Um, we are saying, you know, God, something terrible has happened. It happened to me or it happened to someone I love. It, it's wrong. It's evil. It's not the way it's supposed to be. I, I'm outraged about this. I'm angry. Um, I need you to deal with this. I know that your word says vengeance belongs to you, not to me. <laughs> I need you to do what's right. And Lord, you know, I'm easily going to going to make a mess of this and, and, and become uh, and fall into sin uh, if I don't hand this over to you. Um, we hand our outrage to God and accept that he's going to handle that injustice in the way that he sees best. And um, we, we hand our enemies over to God's compassion and his justice and say, Lord, do what you will with him. Sometimes God turns our enemies into friends, right? I mean, we see an example of that in Scripture with uh, Saul of Tarsus, persecutor of the church, and God turns him into one of the, the you know, an amazing apostle. But that, that's where the, the act of faith comes in. Like, God, I don't know how this ought, I don't know exactly how this ought to be resolved, but you do. And you're God, not me, so I'm going to accept what you think is best. Uh, Psalm 140, uh, 12 and 13, after praying against enemies, um, the psalmist says, I know the, that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and will execute justice for the needy. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. The upright shall dwell in your presence. So after bringing his outrage to God, the psalmist says, Lord, you're, you are the just judge, and you're going you're gonna to stand up for the needy and the afflicted, and I leave it in your hands. Uh, none of this, none of what I'm saying uh, precludes seeking justice in, in lawful ways, public justice. I'm not talking about that. I'm not saying, you know, a crime gets committed and you, you, know, you don't let the law run its course with the criminal. I, I'm just saying from a personal standpoint, um, we don't need to seek revenge because we've, we've entrusted the enemy and the situation to the Lord. But there's a, another step, you know, bring your outrage to God and trust God with the outcome. And then finally, you know, maybe in the back of your mind, you've been thinking, well, what about Jesus' commands to love your enemy? Well, the next step is love your enemy. These, um, these imprecatory psalms are not incompatible with Jesus' instruction about how we're to treat those who, who mistreat us. Um, the the so-called hate prayers are not an end in themselves. Uh, they're, they're a step in the process of seeking to obey Jesus' command to love our enemies and to pray for those who harm us. So, you know, after we bring our outrage to God, after we entrust it to him, um, we can, over time, begin to experience a, a greater freedom to show love. Maybe even eventually to forgive when appropriate. Remember our forgiveness class and all that we said about forgiveness. Um, why? 
because we know that injustice will not win in the end. We know that, that God's going to deal with the wrongs that were done against me some way, some fashion, either through the cross or at the final judgment. God's got this. He's not overlooking it. It's a big deal to him. And so I've entrusted it to him, which means I now can take a different posture toward the enemy. It doesn't mean the enemy becomes my best friend. It doesn't mean the enemy becomes somebody I really delight to be in their presence. But I, can, I don't have to retaliate against them. Um, I could even pray for them, which pray that justice would be done. I could pray that the Lord would change them, transform them from an enemy into a brother or a sister in Christ. So we bring the rage, we, we entrust it to God, and we're freed up to love. We, we recognize that, that we've often behaved as enemies. And yet, God has forgiven us in and through Christ. We recognize, hey, God might actually do, God might actually transform this person so that they're not an enemy anymore. Or he's going to do what, you know, the judge of all the earth will do rightly. And so we're now freed to, to walk in ways of peace, to walk in ways of righteousness and integrity and neighborly love rather than resorting to revenge. So I know that's a lot and we've only scratched the surface of um, the imprecatory Psalms. Um, what, uh, and I don't know that I'll have all the answers, or I, I know I won't have all the answers. I don't know that I'll have the answers for what um, you ask, but what, um, I got a couple questions. Um, in what ways could praying like this be helpful for you? I've got another question about what might be confusing about it. But Yeah, Nevin has the mic. Kev. Um, it doesn't sound like it's... Oh, it is okay. Uh, I have so many questions, um, but as I see it in the Psalms and I, and I pray myself when I'm angry about something, um, I, I usually find the compassion is mixing in. One, because I recognize the same sin nature that is causing someone else to, um, to do these things is there in myself. And secondly, because I know that they are a slave to sin, then my compassion begins to well up too. And my hatred sort of redirects toward our, our true enemy because he's implacable. He, he won't change. And, um, and so the prayer really turns back. I guess that's the only way that I can think of hating with a perfect hatred is that God deal with sin and injustice in the whole world, but put down our enemy. Mm. And, you know, he promises to do that. And all these other things are kind of symptoms of that in the world. And I don't hate them with a perfect hatred. I don't know what that means. You notice I conveniently didn't explain what that means, because I don't either. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, up here. Bruce, that uh, Nevin's going to bring the over, over here. Different Bruce. Uh, when you uh, pray, love your enemy, I think in ourselves, it's impossible. So what we're actually doing is we're asking God to change our hearts and to recognize uh, how great a need we have for him. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably the greatest mm -hmm. prayer we can do. One thing I forgot to say is, um, you know, praying, you know, some of those things we looked at, especially Psalm 109, they sound very harsh. But um, praying these psalms for our enemies can actually be a way of loving them. We're praying, God, 
that God would intervene and stop them from doing more evil. That's actually a loving thing to pray for, for both the potential victims and for the perpetrator himself. So, um, yeah, Craig. Thanks. I think part of what can, can make this, could make it, can make it helpful in our lives too, is it um, keeps us from thinking we can short circuit the process. I th when I, so when I look at this sheet, I just look at and, and hear what you say. It's like, well, at the end, we get to love our enemy. So can't we just stuff it and then just get to the Skip, super yeah. spiritual thing? Skip the whole process. And that's denying our creatureliness. That's, that's pride, thinking we don't need God to walk us through it. So I, I think it could do good in us to bring this to God and the humility that that takes to say, I need you to do this process um, and get me there. It that to me takes a lot of humbling compared to I can just pretend that I can love my enemy and then it's going to like pop out of me in all these ways that I'm just trying to stuff. So It's the same with the Psalms of Lament. You know, we, we know that we have lots of reason to rejoice in the Lord. Like we have this wonderful hope and all these things. But, you know, when, when something happens that causes grief and, and loss and all that, you can't jump from just that moment, that, that experience of the grief and loss right to the like, you know, the hallelujahs, there's a process. The lament psalms are that process. These imprecatory psalms are the process for moving from just those overwhelming emotions of outrage to now let me try to faithfully love these, these people. Kind of to me what that, what the Psalms do for me personally. Everybody's different, and some of you are more mature than I am. But what, what I see in it is that we look for a new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. And it's like, yeah, we want the violent, we want the bad people gone, but we don't want anybody to go to hell. One way, you know, a prayer um, we find in, in the New Testament and that we mention sometimes in our service, come quickly, Lord Jesus, or we talked a few weeks ago, the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done. We're praying part of that is these, these psalms, that uh, wickedness and evil would be put down, that God's righteousness would flood uh, the world and the renewed earth. All right, uh, maybe just one or two What's confusing to you about, about these psalms? Or confusing about how you might make use of them as a Christian? Beth's got her hand up up here. I don't know if I personally feel like I have this kind of enemies or have really experienced in life. So it's a interesting topic. But... I think it makes me think about how we might go wrong in interpreting this. Like, in this is, seems like it's about people or about Satan. But sometimes we think of other things as our enemies. Mm. Like, we think of illness as our enemy. And then it gets mixed up with um, accepting the sovereignty of God and that mm. we'll die. So, anyway, those are just... Mm -hmm comments. Mm -hmm. One way we can make use of, because Beth's point about, I don't feel like I have enemies like that, is, you know, a lot of us probably could say that. And one, one benefit of Psalms like this is it also helps us recognize we have friends, family, brothers, and sisters that do have enemies like this, and it gives us a way to pray for them, even if our own personal experience is not that, at least right now. Um, it, it does give us a way to, to maybe pray for those who are in the thick of it in that way. Um, I think Michael. Yeah. yeah. I think it's interesting um, when I think about bringing these things to God, just um, I guess kind of it'd be one, one thing if it was just, oh, I'm angry. I'm going to lay this at your feet and then move on. But then it's like 
the process of bringing that and then all the other factors that come into play and that wrestling with it is just kind of um, sometimes overwhelming. So I think it's, um, I think, I don't know if, it, if you would describe it more as like this is a tool and that this is a process and that through time and practice you become skilled in this um, or if it's like, there's some other things that may it's, or may not. Yeah, I should say it's not a one and done thing. Like, oh, I prayed my rage and now I've handed it over to God and I never need to think about it again. Yeah, process. And it's one tool among a whole host of biblical tools uh, that we have for, for dealing with anger and that kind of thing. It's, it's one, one of the tools. And, and um, again, not necessarily one single prayer either. All right, maybe one other if anybody's got. Maybe at some future service, we need to read an imprecatory psalm in our service and have an appropriate prayer to follow. Um, all right, let me, let me pray for us and then uh, we'll, we'll be done for this morning. Our Father in heaven, uh, we want to faithfully engage our anger when it's righteous, when it's unrighteous, we want to bring it before you and have you um, work in us, Lord, so that there would not be any uh, wicked way in us. But we also want to be honest, Lord, about what goes on inside us, and especially in light of the, the, the real evil, the real wicked that, that happens um, to us or to people we know and love. Uh, Father, would you help us to be a people who pray honest prayers, who bring our outrage before you so that you might deal with us, so that you might deal with the perpetrators, so that your perfect will uh, would be done and we could trust you to, to do what is right and good and, and just. Um, so Father, help us to be open uh, before you, unafraid before you in our in our prayer life uh, we ask in Jesus name